My name is Ryan Hill, and I will be talking about Onyx Runtime Gen AI, which is a library that makes using generative AI easy and fast, and it naturally uses Onyx Runtime as the inferencing engine. I'll give an overview of how generative AI models work and the whole process around them. Amusingly, prior to joining the Onyx Runtime team six years ago, I was on the PowerPoint team, and I wrote the code to make the curtain slide transition you're about to see next possible. The trick to making it work was data compression. So here we go. So what is generative AI? It's basically AI that generates text images or other data. So usually you give it a prompt. So for example, in this case, I used the Bing AI to generate an image. And the prompt I gave it was, draw a computer or laptop doing stand-up comedy. And then I decided to have it also write a joke. So the prompt I gave it was write a joke about generative AI. And it came up with this. Why did the generative AI model cross the road? The answer, because it was trained on chicken jokes. And then I also had it draw a human groaning at the AI joke. So I'm sure pretty much everybody here has heard of Chad but what happens like right below the surface? So the first thing that happens when you give it a prompt, like the best pet is a, it turns it into an array of tokens. And they're just, just an array of numbers. They're usually not that high. The, the ranges I've seen tend to be at most like around 50,000 or so is the maximum number. And I'll of course get in, I'll explain more about the tokens in a later slide. And so the tokens get sent to the AI model, which then will output more tokens, which of course are the answers. And so translating those tokens back into text is dog. So for example, in this case, the best pet is a, and the AI completes it as dog. So when turning the text into tokens, it's not just a lookup of token to word. Um, uh, so I, I gave an example here where you can see the turns into a single token, quick turns into a single token, so it is brown, but fox turns into fo and then x as separate tokens, and emoji turns into m o n g. So it really depends on the model, and the tokens cover like all individual letters and even a bunch of unicorn symbols and emojis, but they're not exactly words and it is model architecture dependent, but just something to keep in mind and amusing to know. So now we come to the most important part of what the AI model actually outputs, which is called the logits, which are really just a vocabulary sized array of scores. So uh, if anybody's familiar with the AI model that rec uh, recognizes say uh, numbers, um, so like zero through nine, it doesn't just say what number it recognizes. It's, it, has an out, it has 10 outputs and it says how likely it thinks the number is each of them. It gives a, basically it gives a score for every possible number. So if you write a seven, the seven will have the highest score, but a one, since a one kind of looks like a seven, will also have a lesser score, but it'll show you how much it thinks it's each possible number. So in a similar way, a large language model will say, will give a score for which word it thinks is the most likely next word or that should follow. So for example, in this case, if the input string was the best pet is a, you can see here's the score for each possible next word. Now, granted this list is normally like 50,000 entries long. So I just put a subset here to, as an artificial example to make it more clear, but you can see how the score for dog would be much higher than for example, the score for potato because it just doesn't make any sense. But other words that are also reasonable fits like cat and hamster also have reasonably high scores. And so the job of the 
the library around it is to how do we take these scores and generate a sentence from it? So if we don't want the pet to always be a dog, what can we do? Well, the answer to that is something called sampling. And the two popular methods are top K and top P. And so top K is as simple as it sounds. You're saying the top four, in this case, when K is four, you would take the top four highest scores and then sample within those. And by sampling within those, what we would do is just normalize these scores such that they all sum to one. Um, this just simplifies the how to do the randomization. And there's also another step called temperature, which I'll get into in the next slide. Um, but we, we generate a random number, say, say we generate the random number uh, 0.6. And so what we do is as we go down the list, we subtract the uh, the current score from that random number. So we would see 0.5 drops it down to 0.1, and then we see it's it hits somewhere in cat. So the answer would be cat in this case. And you can see how the random numbers are weighted towards the ones with the higher scores. But there is a small chance it'll say the pet is a giraffe. So what can we do about that? Well, the answer is top P. And the way top P works is you want to say, rather than the, just the top N scoring elements, you want to have the top scores that sum to a certain, um, certain percentage. So in this case, you're saying, I want the scores that cover 0.7 of, of the probability curve. And so that'll drop out the unlikely answers, like giraffe will just disappear completely. But we might also lose hamster in this case, because the 0.7 would uh, would cover dog and cat. And that's top P is also uh, more expensive to do because you can, like, you can see how in order to calculate this, we have to go through all of the scores and normalize them and do math on them. Whereas top K, it's really just saying the top four entries you. You can do a simple search through the uh, entries more efficiently for that one. But that's the those are the two ways of doing the sampling. And you can actually combine both for better performance. So for example, with a vocabulary of like 50,000, you might want to say do the top K of the top uh, 50 entries and then do top P on those 50 entries because it's a lot faster to do top P on 50 than the entire 50,000 vocabulary entries. And so there's another parameter to the top K and the top P, which is called the temperature. And all that does is amplify and reduce the differences between the scores. So for example, if you take the original scores and you want it to be more random, like say it was very heavily weighted towards dog, like, well, you're, you're 10, it's going to still be very dog heavy. Um, so you want it to spread across more animals. So you would raise the temperature, which you can see in this case would lower the score of dog and boost the scores of the rest. It would basically just flatten, like if, if you could think of it as a graph, it kind of flattens the graph and makes the scores more equal to each other. And you can also do the reverse. You can lower the temperature to increase the score of the high scoring ones. You basically, if there's a difference in the scores, you amplify the difference. So the highest scoring ones will float to the top but that's what temperature is so there is an additional way of uh, picking the tokens besides the top scoring one and top k and top p so when there is a best answer that you're trying to get well i shouldn't say best but a better answer than the rest uh, with no randomness then you a greedy search is not always going to find that so for example in the game of chess the highest scoring immediate move is probably the one that takes the highest valued piece, but that's not the way to win the game. Um, you want it to be, you want a long-term strategy that eventually takes the king. Um, so you need to try other lowing, lower scoring moves that lead to higher, even higher scoring moves in the future. And so that's what beam search does. And the way is it will try multiple like uh, basically multiple greedy searches in parallel, each trying a different top scoring token. 
um, obviously, yeah, not the same top scoring token, but different ones. And then over time, it will, it's basically a competitive race between the four different ones and seeing which ones, which one winds up with the highest scoring token sequence overall. Um, so for example, like in speech recognition, you might think, oh, this next word is very likely this word, but you'll change your mind once you hear the next, the word after it. And so an AI model can't go back and change its mind. Once it picks a token, well, once we've told it which token to pick, it it then has to then fit the next one with that previous one. And so Beam Search is the way around that. So why not just use Onyx Runtime directly? Why do we need a separate uh, Gen AI library? Um, well, the answer is because Onyx Runtime models are stateless. Um, they were designed where you just have a run call and you send your inputs in, you get your outputs out, but nothing changes in a model. Um, models are constant. And so the problem is, is that large language models and generative AI models, basically, uh, they do have a state. Like they, when they're outputting a token, they need to remember what happened previously. And so there needs to be extra code to handle this. And the Gen AI library takes care of handling all the, the model state. And as I was explaining previously, it also handles the scoring for you. So rather than having to do the top K, top P stuff and the beam search, it handles the scoring of the logits, handles the model's internal state. There's other parameters that models have that I'll also explain, um, but the Gen AI library just makes it easy for you and takes care of all those details. So here's an example of the actual inputs and outputs of one of the language models. So you can see, um, and I, I was just using Netron and just opening the model in there and listing the inputs and outputs. So you can see there's the input IDs and those are just the input tokens. Um, so those are pretty self-explanatory, but then there's these other things like an attention mask. Uh, why would you care about an attention mask? Well. The model cares because it needs to use it internally, but it's not really something the user would want to provide directly. Um, the same thing is with the past and the present. Now, that's something known as the KV cache, the key value cache. Um, you can think of that as just the model's thoughts about the previous tokens and this the past present stuff will grow in size every iteration. There's um, there's they the number of them it varies between the models the names of them vary between the models like i gave an example here where you can see it's past uh th these ones are like past zero through past seven that goes like i think it, this one goes to past 30. Um, i'm just truncating it in but other models they'll separate them out into two things there's past key values dot key uh past key values and a number dot value uh they're all arbitrarily different and it, there's obviously a pattern to it, but it's one that you'd have to uh, manually implement each time for each model. And there's, there's also, um, let's see, oh yeah, the output logits are the output, which are pretty self-explanatory. That's, that's the logits that we're really interested in, but we don't really care about all this other stuff. Like that should be handled automatically. And that's what the Gen AI library takes care of for you. So for the Gen AI library itself, there's three main object types that it implements. One is the model, and which are, for example, Llama, Phi2, those the standard models that everybody's familiar with. And that really just refers to a folder on disk. So for example, here is a Llama models folder uh, files, and you can see it has a configuration file. There's an Onyx file, there's a data file that is part of the onyx file and you can see this is obviously where all the weights are and then there's tokenizer files um, which the tokenizer uses to encode and decode the tokens for this model um, so yeah that's that's the tokenizer part there um, then there's the generator object which is the one that that is a uh, the state the one that handles the runtime state for every sequence of tokens so for example, normally if you wanted to do multiple token sequences, you'd load a model once 
and reuse it since this never changes and you'd create a generator for each sequence of tokens you want to generate through it. So every prompt, you'd create one generator, run, run through the generator and get your tokens out. So the first file you saw in that directory was called config.json, and it is a JSON file that describes the model. Um, so you can see here, here's a simplified one um, for the Llama model, and you can see it has a model section that specifies the architecture. Um, then it has the decoder, which is just the file name of the Onyx file that the model uses. Then it has all the other parameters about the model models internals and also how the kv ca cache uh, inputs and outputs are labeled like what the pattern is for them the types of the inputs and outputs um, and the vocabulary size because that's going to be the size of logits um, then there's also other information like the um, some special tokens like uh, the beginning token the end token the then default search parameters like What's our maximum length of tokens the model can handle, uh, our minimum length, and our recommended search for parameters. So for example, for the Llama model, we're saying we recommend doing top P sampling with a value of 0.7 and a temperature of 0.6. Um, these files are not ones that people should typically be having to modify. Like we aim to have these be auto-generated when you source the model through our tools, but this is how these files work. So the, I think the best way to show how it works is to show an actual code sample. And so I'm using Python here, um, and it's really this simple. Um, if you have it installed, it's called Onyx Runtime Gen AI. Um, then you would just create a model um, by giving it a path to the directory and saying the device type you want to use, in this case, CUDA. Um, then we just say create a tokenizer for it. Um, then we create the search parameters. Um, this is really al allows you to override the default search parameters that we give. Um, but if you just want to use the defaults, then it's just creating the search parameters for the model. And the search parameters also are where you specify the inputs to the model. And so in this case, our input IDs, we're saying tokenizer and code, the best pet is a. And so this will turn the text into the array of tokens. And then we can just say model.generate of these search params. It's a very, this is the high level um, API that'll just do, do all, do a complete sequence of tokens in one step. I mean, internally, it's obviously doing them one at a time, but if you don't care how, how it does each iteration, you just want the final result, this is the API to use. And so here we get the output tokens and we print the result. And so, yeah, it'd be like the best pet is a dog. Uh, probably not that exact answer in this case, but that is that is a possibility for what this one could output. Now, if you want more control over how things happen, like say you want to print the tokens as they're generated, or you want to change your scoring, like uh, or change the, the type of sampling as you go, then this is what you'd want to use. Um, so this is very similar to the previous one. The difference is now, instead of just saying a model.generate, we say create a generator object. Um, and so what that exposes is the token generation loop here. So you can see this loop will iterate once for every token you generate. And you can, it's, it's running the model once every iteration. So here is where we tell the model to run and we get the logits. Then if we want to do extra scoring operations, we do them in here. For example, if we wanted to do like a repetition penalty um, and change it per iteration, we could do that in here. And in this case, it's just computing the logits and saying, based on these logits, then use top P sampling of these values, which could change every iteration if you wanted to generate the whole sequence. And the loop exits like in the previous case, and then there's your output tokens like you had before. So as proof that everything actually works, I have a demo of a Python script on my just local dev machine with an old GTX 1080. 
run a Phi2 demo with a simple input prompt of basically a, um, writing a function to say if a number is prime. And you'll see it in the video. So here we go. So starts by just loading the whole model in the memory. We see some Onyx runtime messages. There's the input prompt, and then it will start. Now this is the point where it starts running the model, and you can. This demo has it showing the tokens as they're generated, which is a feature we're going to have in the future. But there it is. Uh, not the best implementation of is prime, but uh, it it is getting better, and it it does work. So to summarize, the Gen AI library basically just makes it really easy to use generative AI models. Um, you could use it at the highest level of just, I have some text and I want to get the answer back. Or you can drop down to the level of intercepting like each token as it's generated in case you wanted to display something on the uh, screen as it was happening or do any other processing or even custom scoring. Like it lets you like do whatever you want in whichever way you want to do it, but you don't have to write all the model handling code. You don't have to deal with the actual scoring algorithm stuff. It just lets you get right to the chase. So for more information, I provided some links on this slide. The first one is to the Onyx Runtime Gen AI project itself, which is easy to find without the link. Um, I also provided some links to documents that talk about the details of top K and top P scoring and also beam search for anybody interested in really getting into the low level details of how 